Okay. A couple of important things about this. First of all, great performance from deliberate practice seems to be unlimited. That is, if you keep doing it, you will keep getting better. And it's not clear what the limit is. There's been a lot of research to support this. One of the best and simplest examples was when the researchers decided to test somebody on something that psychologists call the digit span task. This is a very simple thing. Here's how it works. I read you a list of random digits at the rate of one per second. Then I stop, we wait 20 seconds, and that's important, and then you repeat the digits back to me in the correct order. That's it. That's all it is. Most people max out at around seven digits, maybe nine. Not very many, but it's that 20 second pause that makes it so difficult. Years and years ago, some people had tried to see how far they could go. They'd gotten up to 14 digits. So some researchers took a guy at Carnegie Mellon. They took an undergraduate at Carnegie Mellon and decided to train him on the digit span task. They tested him ahead of time. His IQ was average. His memory was average. And they started training him on this. They got him up to seven and nine. They got him past 14. They got him up to 22 digits, and there's a recording, which I have heard, of him doing the 22 digits. And he's at the end, he's screaming, he's clapping his hands. You know, he can't, he, he's working, trying to get the 22nd digit, and he does. And then he keeps going. They keep pushing him, right? Constantly pushing him, just beyond his ability. He gets up to 30, keeps going. They do this for months and months and months. He eventually gets to 82 digits, OK? Now, just so you know, that's 82 digits. But remember, he didn't get to see them like we're seeing them. He only got to hear them. Wait 20 seconds and then repeat them. Now, just two things to take out of this. One, he didn't stop at 82 digits because that was his limit. He stopped because he graduated and decided there was more to life than memorizing random digits. <laughs> the second thing to remember is, and in fact, they took uh, other undergraduates and put them through the same thing, and they actually got to 100 digits and even over, over 100 digits. The second thing to remember is, what would you or I say if we saw this kid being read 82 digits, waiting, and then repeating 82 in the correct order? What would we say? Every one of us would say, that kid has an incredible gift for memory, because there's no other explanation. This is superhuman. No normal person could do this. He's got a gift for memory. We'd all say that. And yet, in this case, we know it isn't true, because they tested him ahead of time. His IQ and his memory were just the same as you and me. It is something for us all to remember the next time we see a great performer and find ourselves thinking, wow, what a gift. It's the only explanation. Okay, so that's one thing. The other thing is great performance from deliberate practice defies the limits, in quotes, of age. In other words, if you keep doing it, it appears that you can keep performing at a very high level well past the ages when this is not supposed to be possible. And in a work environment where a lot of people are either wanting to or having to work to much later ages than previously thought possible, this is an important finding. Okay, So you probably don't recognize this person, but this is Stanley Drucker, who was principal clarinetist right up the street at the New York Philharmonic. He retired not too long ago. And when I saw the announcement, I first didn't think much of it. It seemed to say that he was retiring from the Philharmonic at age 61, which sounded right, reasonable, looked reasonable. 
Then I looked more closely. No, he was retiring from the Philharmonic after 61 years with the orchestra. He had joined at age 19. He was retiring at age 80. Had a very short resume. Okay. <laughs> now, the point is, for his farewell concert, he played the Aaron Copland Clarinet Concerto, who's the soloist. It's an extremely difficult, demanding work, and he played it from memory. At age 80, how could he, A, remember the work to play it from memory, and B, do what you have to do manually, dexterously, to play this incredibly demanding work? Well, the answer is he never stopped the deliberate practice act. Now, age does ultimately impose a sort of limit, if you understand what I'm saying, right? It reminds me of what Warren Buffett said not too long ago when he wrote, I have reluctantly abandoned my hope to continue managing the portfolio after my death, <laughs> giving up on my plan to give new meaning to the phrase thinking outside the box. So, <laughs> but it's possible to perform at much later ages than we ever thought. Okay, these are the basic principles. Here's the next big issue. Applying them in our organizations, most organizations don't. It is an incredible thing that these principles, well, understand in, well understood in music, sports, piloting a jet, doing surgery, we seem to forget about them when we come to work. So what can be done? Well, it's a huge opportunity frankly. And we are now beginning to see organizations applying some of these principles in a work environment. Here's a simple example that I'm very familiar with personally. It's a medical products company that was introducing a new product, which they sold to doctors and hospitals. They decided to prepare for the launch using exactly the principles of deliberate practice, because they were familiar with the research. And so they did a few things. Here's what they did. First of all, salespeople attended classes to learn about the new product. Well, there's nothing strange or revolutionary about that. That's pretty normal. They prepared presentations to teach what they had learned on the principle that the best way to learn anything is to have to teach it to somebody else. So these presentations, of course, would then become their sales presentations. They practiced these repeatedly before managers and on videotape over a six week period. That is, they would give the presentation to managers who would critique them and push them exactly in accord with the prince, push them just beyond what they were able to do and have them do it again. They would also do it on video so they could see themselves and be told how to improve, pushing them just beyond what they were able to do. And they also practiced using the product on simulators. They're very advanced medical simulators nowadays, as you may know. And so they could do it, again, exactly the same way. Do it, be told what was wrong so that they could do it a little better, over and over and over. And for a long time, six weeks, two notable results. One, all the salespeople complained, all right? not surprising. This was not what they were used to. This was strange. It's not what their competitors did. It's not what they ever did. It was an awful lot of work, more than they were accustomed to doing in preparation for a new product. And they were good salespeople. They wanted to be out there selling, not sitting in a conference room doing these presentations over and over and over. Okay, so they all complained. Second thing is, the results were almost literally off the charts. Before the training, 25% of customers converted to the new product. After the training, 95% of customers converted. And this was during the last recession. This was millions and millions of dollars of incremental revenue and incremental profit that clearly resulted directly from the training. And this is what we see more generally. Using the deliberate practice principles felt weird, 
felt strange. It was way more work than they were used to doing. And it was way, way more than worth it. Okay, some more ideas. Applying the principles in your development as a leader. Understand that you're not just doing a job, but are also being stretched and grown, pushed just beyond your abilities. It's hard for most of us to take time away from our work to actually practice the way athletes and musicians do. But on that idea, the most successful leaders find ways to develop themselves not just through practice, but also within their jobs. They find ways to push themselves just beyond their abilities within their jobs. And we can talk about that in the Q&A if you like, but that is the general principle. It's hard. It's not what others are doing. The most successful leaders understand the critical role of teachers and of feedback for everyone in the organization, including themselves. Remember, continual feedback is one of the principles of deliberate practice. There's a reason that even the greatest golfers have golf teachers. We all need this. Call it a mentor, a coach, a teacher, whatever you like. But without a lot of feedback, we're not going to get any place nor will the others in our organization. The most effective feedback is constructive, non-threatening, work-focused rather than person-focused. I'm not going to take time to elaborate on that now. Next steps. To what extent is the deliberate practice framework reflected in how you work now? That's the first question to ask. The answer is it's probably not reflected very substantially at all, but whatever. That's the first question. Then, where is the opportunity to think differently, to apply these principles in ways that may strike others as strange? Two most important questions, finally. A, what do you really want? This is hard. Doing deliberate practice every day is hard. You're being pushed just beyond your abilities. By definition, that means you're going to make mistakes. Most people don't like that. It's hard. So you better be doing something that you really want. And then the second question, the one we started with. What do you really believe? All of the world's greatest performers encounter terrible difficulties along the way. There are no exceptions. Now, if you really believe that great performance comes from an innate gift that you have or you don't, then when you encounter the inevitable difficulties, you will take them as evidence that you don't have the gift. And you'll give up, logically enough, in light of what you believe. But if you really believe that great performance comes from deliberate practice, then when you encounter the inevitable difficulties, you will keep going because you know it works. And thus, it is not going too far to say that what you really believe about the source of great performance is the foundation of all you will ever achieve. And in fact, the message is quite liberating. Great performance is not reserved for a preordained few. It is available to you and to everyone. It's an honor to speak with you about these things. Thanks, everybody.